Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Blockbusting, the podcast where we love to hate the movies. I'm your host, Jay Light. Joining me today, Nat Baymel. Oh, thanks for having me and for pronouncing my name right. Look I, at you. I've known you for a number of years now. I feel I, I would feel ashamed if I didn't pronounce your name right. I have a lot of friends that have known me for years, and I'm just too meek to correct them when they're still mispronouncing my last name. With that jacket on, you're not too meek. That's uh, a that's a tough man's jacket, Nat. I appreciate you saying so. I am very self conscious and don't think I'm cool enough to pull this jacket off. So thanks you, for the build up. You're just cool enough to pull that jacket off. I am at the minimum level of coolness. Uh, Nat is coming to us today, not only because uh, he's a very funny stand up, but he's also got an album to promote. I do indeed. Thank you for bringing that up. It's called of Be Nice. It's out now on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, Spotify. I heard it's on uh, at some radio on Pandora already. So great, scoop it up. Good deal, man. You recorded that at comedy, uh, comedy off main, uh, comedy off state, uh, comedy on state, comedy on state. Cool. I knew it was a club where comedy and state were in the name. Uh, it's in Wisconsin, correct? Yep, Madison, to be precise. Wonderful. I hear nothing but great things about that club. One it's of my, magical. One of my favorite comedy albums, Mark Norman, Still Got It, was recorded there. And uh, I'm I, very excited. I haven't listened to your album yet, but I am very excited to uh, put that in my ears at some point soon. Oh, I can't wait for you to tell me how you feel about it. You know, I'm really excited about to talk about how I feel about is the movies that are at the box office right now. Um, uh, top tens. Coming to us courtesy of Box Office Mojo, Black Panther tops $500 million, becoming 10th largest domestic release of all time. And it's only going to make more from here on out, too. Yeah, it really is. It's dropping by minuscule amounts. It is currently still number one, three weeks in a row at the box office, made six, almost $66 million this weekend. I mean, is there anything on the horizon coming out that's gonna topple it from the number one spot? Like, what's coming out? Probably not. I mean, I can. I'm gonna take a look at the release schedule here right now for the next couple of weeks. I don't think there's anything that's gonna even close to get it really uh, a wrinkle in time. Possibly, uh, that for sure will do it. Possibly, and Tomb Raider almost certainly will not. Um, yeah, it doesn't look like there's, there's much out there that might. You could, I could see. Uh, Pacific Pacific Rim Uprising probably won't do it. Uh, Ready Player One might do it, but that's yeah, not coming that, out until the end of the month. Oh, I didn't even realize it was already coming out that soon. Yeah, dude, time flies. It's March. Yeah, and now they announced that the Avengers is moving up a week or so on their release date. It's oh, did April they? Yeah, it's April 27th instead of May 4th now. Oh, boy. Well, uh, yeah, that's probably going to be the two to watch. Yeah, summer movie season starting earlier and earlier now. It's like Christmas. Mm -hmm. Something tells me A Wrinkle in Time won't pull it off. I think A Wrinkle in Time is probably going to still wind up coming close. It'll be the closest one so far. I think it'll do... Like, I can always tell when a movie will do well based on whether or not my girlfriend wants to watch it. So if we're watching uh, movie trailers, I'll sort of just look over at her and she'll give me the little like Johnny Carson nod to the couch and be like, oh, okay, this movie's going to do well because she seems Come over. actually interested in it. Come take a seat. I And as it continues to climb, it makes me even more sad that I haven't had the time to go see Black Panther yet. Oh, you still haven't seen it? No. Alas, alas, alack, I have not seen Black Panther. It's good. You, sh you said that with a shrug in your voice. I don't want to say it's the greatest thing ever because I don't want to get your hopes up because I assume everyone's doing that right now because most of the time whenever I go to see a movie that's been hyped for a month or two months or God forbid years, I wind up just being disappointed in it. So I'd say it's good and you would enjoy it. Okay. So I'm just trying to keep it as neutral as possible. And are you saying that as somebody who knows I don't like superhero movies that much? Uh, I'd say I didn't know you didn't like them, but I would say it's still enjoyable. Okay, cool. I'm going to take your word for it. Thank yeah. you, Nat. Uh, number two and three of the box office, the only two new releases of this week and the only two to crack into the top ten. Good for them. At number two, Red Sparrow with $17 million. And then Death Wish remake starring Bruce Willis at number three with $13 million. I'm very happy to hear that Death Wish movie tanked. Yeah. I'm very happy. Like that... Well, 
I've seen nothing except the initial trailer that came out a few months ago, and it didn't seem like it even knew what movie it was that it was promoting, because it started off all grim, and his family was murdered, and he wants revenge, and then they kick him with ACDC. <laughs> yeah, I think it's one of those movies that's it seems tonally all over the place, especially given that, for whatever reason, the studio decided to not hold off on releasing it in the wake of the uh, the Parkland shooting. Oh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, you got a. I mean, you got a movie where a man is righteously running around shooting people with a bunch of crazy guns. It might it maybe uh, maybe show a little bit of tact. But at the same time, though, I mean, how long can they really hold it off? Because I mean, it's just gonna happen again and again and again. And this True. Isn't me being pessimistic. This is me being you, realistic. That's you being realistic. Because it's I'm, just them setting a precedent where it's like, okay, we can't release this gun movie uh, right after a gun tragedy, and then it becomes the point where, okay, well, then no more gun movies. There's, you know, what it probably is on the studio's mind is there has to be a victim minimum that they are going to be like, all right, we can't release the movie after this. Like if we had another Virginia Tech where you get into the into the 30s. We're going to have to hold off, but they didn't even crack t- 20 with this one. Yeah, so. I'm, I'm guessing it's 18. They're like 17. Whoo, that was close. All right, I think we can still get away with this. If it cracks its way into the top five shootings at all time, then it's not going to crack into the box office. And so that's that's the, I think, the, uh, I'd be very, the line, the bar that has to be cleared. I'd be very interested to look at movies that came out right around the time of some of the top shootings in America. Because was uh, Columbine, it was after The Matrix, wasn't it? I think it might have been because like, Columbine was April '99. Yeah, and, and the Matrix was. I think let's that take been a look earlier in '99 or later Matrix, '98. Yeah, the Matrix was a month beforehand. Yeah, because I do remember the Matrix constantly coming up in conversation about oh, yeah, why it, they did it. Because they're like, yeah, he wore a trench coat, and they wore trench coats. Yeah, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see what Hollywood would do in the wake afterwards of these things. Like, how many times has there been a crazy, horrible tragedy like that, and then they still... Well, at the same time, though, they have all those tragedy movies, like the Earthquake and all the tsunami movies, I'm sure, that came out right after those. Yeah, but those are movies that are like... You know, it's different because it's a God-based tragedy and not a human-based <laughs> tragedy. Like, we're getting annihilated by Mother Nature, not by our own the humans. I would like to see that argument. Uh, there's like a horrible earthquake. It's like, we have to ban God in schools because he did this. Yeah, no more prayer in schools. Your Let's prayers get him are, off our money. Your prayers are obviously upsetting him. That's a time when you don't want thoughts and prayers going to the victims because it's just going to fuel God even further to yeah, create yeah, yeah, more yeah. tragedies. <laughs> Uh, let's go down further in the box office. Number four, dropping from number two, is Game Night, mm. which has about ten and uh, two third or th- ten and three quarter million dollars. A movie that I've heard is surprisingly good. I mean, the trailer made it look all right. Yeah, and it's one of those. It's it seems like it's kind of a sneaky box office win. But I'm wary of things like that because Jumanji. Everybody was like, "Oh, that movie's actually really good." And then I saw it, and I was not. I was not. I was not shocked or stunned by how good it was. See, I was like, why, oh, this is not a good movie. That's why I tried not to hype Black Panther for you too I, much. I appreciate that. And I did see Jumanji right when it came out, and I was pleasantly surprised because I had no expectation whatsoever. So I imagine if a, I had a week or two of people said, no, this is so good. I'd go in and think, this is by the numbers. What are you yeah. hyping about this? I Exactly. It's very by the numbers. It's very, it's not a terrible movie. It's certainly not a movie that I am upset that I saw. But it's one of those movies that's just like, okay, you guys made a movie. It's fine. But it's, you know, it's that's still in the box office, too. That's number seven. And it's made almost $400 million domestic. I mean, as a avid pro wrestling fan, I'm always happy when The Rock is making his money. Yeah. Keep the keep the rock cooking, guys. Uh, number five at the box office this week is Peter Rabbit. $10 million even. So it looks like it's going to shake out. Uh, it, it's one of, you know, I don't have any desire to go see this. I just, I just remember seeing a bunch of movies over November and December, and that trailer was in every single one of them. And every single time the trailer started, I knew I had two and a half boring ass minutes that I just couldn't fight my way through, and I just had to sit there and take it. That's when you got to go get snacks. I, but I'm prepared, though. I come in with the snacks. I don't oh, go in. Oh, you're a bring snacks into the movie kind of dude. My girlfriend's got a large purse. Gotcha. What's your usual go-to uh, sneaky snack? So we usually will go with 
M&M's. That's kind of what we've been on for the past couple of times. Although she likes Milk Duds, and I hate Milk Duds. Uh, Milk Duds are gross. Thank you very much. I am going to make her listen to this. They're nasty. Milk Duds, not a good movie snack. I like uh, Trail Mix myself, a good little bag of Trader Joe's Trail Mix. They got a bunch of different cool varieties. Um, I'm, but I, you know what? I'm a popcorn guy. I'm a movie theater popcorn fanatic. See, I used to work at a movie theater, and so popcorn's been forever tainted for me. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. It's always there. I mean, it still tastes good and everything. It's just I just remember all those months of making it and scraping and cleaning it all out, and it's just lost its magic. Did you have to burn all those clothes that you ordered the movie theater because they smelled like popcorn and, and oil forever after that? But the thing is, I still love the smell of it, and so no, I did not burn it. I oh, preserved okay. it. okay. You kept it. Kept it locked away safe. I love, see, that's the thing. I love movie theater popcorn, and I love a good movie theater hot dog. But you have to also order it as a movie theater hot dog. You can't just order a hot dog off the menu. you got to say one movie theater hot dog, please. It is a very specific type of hot dog. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're getting fancy with them, which I don't appreciate. They're adding the apple smoked bacon and yeah. the jalapeno. And what, it's like, no, I want the nasty, weird hot dog that's somehow cold but also will burn you. The bun needs to be stale and broken in half. And a little soggy, too. Why not? Yeah. yeah the arc light's got those sausages in a baguette. And I'm like, what are you doing, guys? You don't need that. And the ketchup dispenser has to have, like, the oil that shoots out first, like the uh, condiment pre-cum that mm-hmm. just hits you beforehand. And yeah. you're just like, this is exactly what I deserve. Now we know. Uh, Annihilation coming in at number six. A movie that I enjoyed. Uh, I am not surprised it's dropping very rapidly through the box office ranks, though. See, I genuinely didn't even know it came out already. Yeah? Well, the thing is, I uh, have ad blocker on my computers, and, you know, I, we have Roku and streaming services, so I'm amazingly sheltered from most advertising. I got gotcha. So the only advertising I ever really see is billboards around Hollywood when I'm driving here, and I never pay attention to the release date. I'll just look at the poster and be like, oh, it's well designed. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Annihilation's been out two weeks. It doesn't look like it's going to make back its uh, its budget, which is a shame. It's a really good movie. I enjoyed it a lot. It's one of those rare, I don't remember if I brought this up on the podcast last week, but it's one of those movies that kind of really does a good job of evoking a feeling in you as opposed to being a movie where you're like, you, you find yourself caring about the plot because it's a very basic plot, but it, the way it makes you feel, it makes you feel some things and very unsettling things too. I'm happy to hear that. Was it uh, an original screenplay or was it based off of something? It's based on a novel, a oh, novel okay. by Jeff Vandermeer called Annihilation. But apparently it has a lot of differences from the the book, which a guy who I saw it with was very upset about as as book nerds so often are. Yeah. Oh, this some dude foreshadowing for Jumper. Yeah. Uh, number six or number seven, we already covered. Number eight, Fifty Shades Freed. Still clinging to the top ten. Good job, guys. Did you see any of those movies by chance? No. Did you? Uh, so I guess maybe about a year ago, my girlfriend and I, we decided to watch the first one because we were scrolling through Netflix and we thought, hey, this is going to be really bad. We can have a laugh. And with all the set scenes, we'll get in the mood afterwards. So we watched it. It wasn't even funny bad, and the set scenes were so awkward that we were like, are you horny at all? No. I'm, I'm, I'm like anti horny. I am unhorny right now. Like, my dick wants to be celibate if we could do that. If we could just not have sex for, like, a week, I would feel better. It's like a chastity belt. Yeah, it's not good. And it was a weird thing because we both read the Wikipedia plot synopsis, so we knew what was going to happen, how dumb it would be. But actually watching the sinew and all of the connective tissue of it, we're just like, oh, no, this is somehow worse when we see why these things happen. Yeah. My girlfriend went to go see it during, uh, on Valentine's Day, she went to go see it with friends, and they snuck bottles of wine into the movie theater and played a drinking game during it, which seems like the most appropriate thing to do while watching a Fifty Shades movie. What's the game? I don't recall. And she was, and I'll tell you what, it got her drunk enough that she barely remembered seeing the movie. So, did Good. a job. Good enough. Congratulations, Fifty Shades Freed. Uh, number nine at the box office is The Greatest Showman. That's still there. Good, still there. Good for it. Yeah, good job, guys. Made uh, t- almost $3 million this weekend. Oh, I thought you were about to say total. I was like, yeesh, that no, is not it's, good. It's made about a little more than $150 million total. That's, that's still well, not very good. I mean, it doubled its uh, its budget, so that's oh, good. Oh, really? Yeah. 
Budget $84 million, and it's been in the box office for 11 weeks. It looked pretty, so way to stretch that dollar in terms of your cinematography. Yeah. And then the final one was Every Day, which is a movie that I don't know what it's about, and I'm even looking at the poster, and I still can't tell what the fuck it's about. Uh, It just sounds like one of those movies that's going to be a white poster. I'm just guessing. White poster, the top and bottom halves of it are just completely white, and then the middle is just like a little strip of characters in front of, let's say, like a window overlooking a lake. You're very close. Really? Actually, it's off-white. Oh, man. And it's got a photo collage of the characters, and there is a lake there. It's literally just like every indie poster you've ever seen, where you look, it's like, someone's going to come of age in this tale, everyone. What's this movie about every day? I have no idea what the fuck this movie is. Every day is a young adult romance and fantasy novel. Uh, Okay. Where people come of age. Age. Yep, it's a coming of age. It's a coming of age story. Uh, probably, let's see here. Somebody probably dies. Uh, oh, it's a story of a person. A a person who wakes up occupying a different body each day. Oh, I think I saw a trailer for that. Yeah. Okay. The narrator, who is a disembodied spirit, ghost, or soul. <laughs> wow. So it's kind of like a sort of Groundhog Day takeoff, but not really. Yeah, it's. Where every day is as different as you could possibly be because you're in a different per. So is it they form a new body or they're just possessing a new they body? They possess a new body. Oh, that's unsettling. That's one of those movies that I think if they had if they hype up like the horror part of it and not the weird coming of ageness of it, it could be a re- that could be a really interesting movie. I would kind of I I kind of want to watch that movie. That would be a fun game where if you look at a movie and say, how would this movie be better if it was a different genre? Yeah. Like Fifty Shades, going back to that, I think that would be better as a horror movie. I think, yeah, Fifty Shades would be great as a horror movie. I think that about, uh, if we look at, let's look at Peter Rabbit. Peter Rabbit would be great as a horror movie. Yeah. It's a, it's sort of like Animal Farm, dystopian. You got you got animals coming and taking an uprising and, and fighting off. God, you know, it would be, that would be a very watchable movie. I, I'm also, horror is my absolute favorite genre, and so I think everything would be better as a horror movie. <laughs> Yeah, I, you might be right there. Jumanji would be a horror movie. Kids getting sucked into a video game and killed. Oh, yeah. You basically just show, like, in graphic detail their deaths as opposed to just laughing about it. The Greatest Showman is a horror movie. It already takes place as a circus, so it's one layer scary enough as it is. It's so easy to turn things into a horror movie. What's the hardest genre to turn it into, though? Um, The hardest genre to turn it into would... Western? I feel like it's hard to turn movies into western, yeah. like harder than we would than we would give it credit for. Because it seems like, oh, you just put it in an old western town and give people guns and put Jeff Bridges in there, but it doesn't really seem like it would play. I don't know. You literally just described every like western I've ever been interested in. But see, I can't imagine. Okay, Black Panther is a western. Oh, dope. Would it would it work? Could you do it? That would be amazing. You've seen the movie, so I have no idea. I mean. The idea of the West, actually, there's elements to it that could be kind of Western-ish. I don't want to spoil it for you, but, you know, there's like a revenge storyline. Oh, that's uh, a classic Western trope. I might be right. And a redemption storyline. Hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, we'll keep that in mind for uh, for when I see it. I'm going to think about other genres that Black Panther could be. Uh, normally, we would cover a bunch of movie news right now, but today we are recording as the Oscars red carpet is happening, and I'm uh, I'm thinking we might be we should prognosticate a little bit. Let's do some predictions. Let's do um, let's focus on just the really like the top category stuff. Yeah, um, I think that uh, let's go. Yeah, let's go from uh, from screenplay on up. So. The obvious choices, I think, for original and adapted are going to be movies that are nominated for Best Picture but not going to win. Yeah. Um, Adapted, I think, is probably going to go to Call Me By Your Name. I'll be honest. I've seen a woeful lack of uh, Academy Award-nominated films this year. So Call Me By Your Name is not among them. I have not seen that. I think the only ones I've seen that are really looking at getting any buzz, I've seen Get Out. I've seen The Big Sick. I've seen Darkest Hour. And I've think that might be it man well this is uh, a terrible segment then this segment is not going to work out I, for our I listeners will guess based solely off of their names what i think i know about the film okay call me by your name i think that it won't win the disaster artist oh it got nominated it's gonna win i saw that movie logan 
Oh, I like that movie too. I forgot how many movies that don't seem like they should be nominated for Academy Award got nominated this year. Because, well, that's the thing about the screenplay categories too are always like a consolation prize sort of category. Yeah. Because they nominate movies that are really interesting because the writing is the most important part of the, of these nominations. So you're going to get some oddballs in there. You're going to get Logan in there. You're going to get the disaster artist in there. Which yeah. uh, Molly's game, Aaron Sorkin is not going to get nominated for anything else, but of course he's going to get nominated for a screenplay. Yeah. So of those, I'm going to guess that Logan will win. I don't. I think it's going to wind up being Call Me by Your Name. I mean, for sure it will be, but I'm going to go with Logan because my gut says so. Sticking hard. Uh, original screenplay. We've got The Big Sick. We've got Get Out. We've got Lady Bird. We've got Shape of Water, and we've got Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Uh, I haven't seen Three Billboards, but it is wildly controversial. So I'm going to guess they're probably not going to give it to that for that role. And it'll, oh, it's definitely going to get out. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah. Because it sure. also, it keeps winning. It's won a lot of screenplay awards at all these other award ceremonies. I think that that is definitely its best shot at getting a really big award. Um, because it's nominated for some other stuff that it's got a much tougher time fighting against. Yeah. Um, and it is a very good original screenplay. I mean, it, it is. It has a lot of horror and thriller tropes in it, but it also gives a message in a medium you're not used to seeing it in. Mm-hmm. And, and it's, it's really great satire, too. Yeah, exactly. And it's not often that you see a sharp satire like that, these days anyway, get nominated in the in the original screenplay category. Yeah, I'm I'm not mad at that at all. Uh, let's go with supporting actor, Willem Dafoe in the Florida project, Woody Harrelson in three billboards, Richard Jenkins in the shape of water, Christopher Plummer in all the money in the world and Sam Rockwell in three billboards. Okay. So I'm going to say it's going to be Christopher Plummer just because of the fact that you came in and you replaced Kevin Spacey and you did the entire movie. And what was it like a week or something? Something like that for the reshoots. Yeah. I think just knowing the backstory of it makes it so much more impressive than everything else. That's, I mean, that's gotta be most of the reason why he got nominated too, is because yeah. they're like, Oh, drama intrigue. It's like when you see a comic special and you're like, that wasn't that good. And they're like, Oh, they did that in six months. And like, really? All right. That's good for six months. I am going to throw my heart in here and give this one to Willem Dafoe. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think the smart money says Sam Rockwell, but I'm not playing with smart money. I'm playing with emotional money. I mean, I've heard, Everyone talked about how good he was in that movie and that he was his performance was one of the most redeeming things about it from people who I know who didn't like it. So, I mean, that made sense. But uh, Christopher Plummer, man, give it to him coming over adversity to make it work. Over- overcoming ageism by casting Kevin Spacey instead of an actual 80 year old man like Christopher yep. Plummer. Best Supporting Actress, we've got Mary J. Blige for Mudbound, Allison Janney for I, Tanya, Leslie Manville for Phantom Thread, Lori Metcalf for Lady Bird, and Octavia Spencer for The Shape of Water. I'm going to say I, Tanya. I'm yeah. going to scoop it up. Uh, again, I haven't seen it. I heard it's fabulous from it all of my gay friends. They love it, and apparently the mother in the movie is just everything for it, so... Yes, let's do that. She's great. I think Allison Janney's probably going to snag this one. If it doesn't go to her, I could see it going to Lori Metcalf. She is, uh, I have mentioned many times on this podcast that I am not a fan of Lady Bird, but Lori Metcalf was the best part of Lady Bird far and away. So I could see her being the outside looking in pick, but it's probably going to go to Allison Janney. It's yeah. her time. She scooped up every other award up until now, so... It's probably going to be that way. I don't know, but sometimes the Academy does love throwing a curveball in. Like The one I always remember is uh, Mickey Rourke and his like, big return to acting tour when he just scooped up every award for The Wrestler. Except for Best Actor. Except for Best Actor. Went to Sean Penn instead. Such a shame. I was mm-hmm. so, so sad that Mickey Rourke didn't win Best Actor. Yeah. Um, let's go to Best Actress. And I think and I think the Academy is going to wind up saving the curveball for later. We'll cover that when we get to some of these other categories. Best Actress. This is a category, I think it's another one that's sort of locked up already. Sally Hawkins for Shape of Water, Frances McDormand for Three Billboards, Margot Robbie for I, Tanya, Saoirse Ronan for Lady Bird, and Meryl Streep for The Post. Mm. I mean, it's dumb to ever bet against Meryl Streep, but I also didn't really hear too many people gushing over her role in that. So yeah. 
Meryl Streep, it's just one of those things. It's like if Meryl Streep's going to get an, if she's in a movie, she's going to get a nomination. Yeah. That's where Meryl Streep is at in her career. She's the sure, she's the sure bet show pony. Yeah. And again, I've heard everyone raving about how great friends at McDormand was. Mm-hmm. So if it's not her, I'm going to guess it's her, but if it's not her, it's going to be Mardo Robbie. I think it's going to be, it's probably Francis McDormand. I think that's the, the easy pick. Um, I could see it going to Saoirse Ronan. I don't, again, I don't like Lady Bird, but they, she got the go, the Golden Globe and she's gotten a couple of other, other awards. So who knows? Um, best actor, Timothy Chalamet for Call Me By Your Name, Daniel Day-Lewis for Phantom Thread, Daniel Kaluuya for Get Out, Gary Oldman for Darkest Hour, and Denzel Washington for Roman J. Israel Esquire. I mean, I think it's going to be Gary Oldman because, again, that's the only movie I saw this year for that category, but he was really great in it. It's probably going to be Gary Oldman, but I'm not going to pick Gary Oldman on principle because I don't want to see Darkest Hour. I don't give a shit about Darkest Hour. I'm going to go with uh, my favorite in this category, which is a tough call, too, because I saw three out of the five movies in this category, and I really liked I really liked Call Me By Your Name, Phantom Thread, and Get Out. but. I'm going to throw it to Daniel Day. Four wins in the best actor category, four Oscars, retire, go out on a high note. See, I'm also starting to reconsider because the Gary Oldman thing, I remember when he won his Golden Globe, when, didn't a couple of blogs come out saying he had a trouble in past with Oh, yeah, he beat abuse. his wife with a telephone. <laughs> yeah, and I imagine the Academy probably doesn't want to award him just in case something else is going to come out or oh, if it's going to resurface again. They already managed to not nominate James Franco in this category. Well, and also for, a lot of other categories. Well, but to, here's the thing. If they're going to go with that, if that's the argument, then I think that he's still probably going to wind up getting the award, even though he has all of those allegations and, and history in the past. Um, which is a shame because this is basically a legacy award for Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman's put on, from what I understand, better performances in other movies. And they're like, oh shit, we haven't given him one yet? All right, let's throw him that. It's Martin Scorsese winning for The Departed because, oh yeah, we didn't give you anything for four? Sorry. Right, exactly. Um, and I'm throwing it to Daniel Day, though. I love Timothy Chalamet and Call Me By Your Name also, but Timothy is such a gifted actor, he's going to wind up winning it. Uh, in another award very soon. Yeah. Uh, coming up on Best Director, we've got Christopher Nolan for Dunkirk. We've got Jordan Peele for Get Out. We've got Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird. We have Paul Thomas Anderson for Phantom Thread. And we've got Guillermo del Toro for The Shape of Water. I think it's a two-way fight between Jordan Peele, uh, Peele and uh, del Toro. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I've... N- I haven't seen Shape of Water. I hear it's great. I hear it's a wonderful vision. It's average. <laughs> well then, uh, in that case, I will say Jordan Peele. My and I and I am. I don't again. This is purely out of spite that I'm not going to pick Guillermo del Toro because the smart money says it's going to be Guillermo del Toro. He scooped up all the other awards so far. Yeah, but I think you got to look here. Jordan Peele is a really strong choice. I think he's more likely to win for screenplay than for director. If I were to pick somebody, I'm going with Christopher Nolan for Dunkirk. Really? Christopher Nolan, this is his uh this is his second best movie behind Dark Knight, I think. And Dunkirk is a really really strong movie, incredibly well directed, and for him to get nominated for this finally after not getting nominated for basically or anything else directorially anyway and for screenplay nominations sure he'll get a, he's gotten a handful of those but i think that this is where my heart lies i'm voting my heart here i'm going it to christopher nolan i do love the fact that we're recording this before it airs and people listening to this already know the results i know so we're just like you dumb bitch jay it's okay i'm gonna go going gonna, with your heart instead I'll, of your brain i'm gonna be a dumb bitch here Finally, we got Best Picture, the toughest category this year. This is a really, really tough category. How many nominees? Is it still 10? This year, this, so it's between 5 and 10 is what's oh, okay. allowed. This year we have nine nominees. We got Call Me By Your Name, Darkest Hour, Dunkirk, Get Out, Lady Bird, Phantom Thread, The Post, Shape of Water, and Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Um, Who won the Golden Globe? Was it Three Billboards? Three Billboards won the Golden Globe. Uh, 
It also won the BAFTA. Shape of Water won the Producers Guild Award, which is usually a big sign for this. But then, out of nowhere, last night, Get Out won the Independent Spirit Award for Best Picture, which has been the predictor for the past four years. Here's the thing I was leaning towards Get Out, but part of me doesn't want it just because of the amount of billboards we've seen in Hollywood for the past year of for your consideration, for your consideration. And and that almost makes me feel like you bought this award. And I know they didn't, but part of me is just like the money you spent on, Hey, what if we got an award for this? Huh? Like just every single time I'm driving in Hollywood, just another, it's like, this is the greatest movie ever, right? We should do an award for this. I'm like, man, no, no, stop. No, I'm fish monster. I'm going with fish monster. God. And I think I, I, for a long time, thought it was going to be the Fish Monster movie, and I didn't want it to be because it is nowhere near quality-wise some of these other movies. Call Me By Your Name is fantastic. Dunkirk's great. Dunkirk's my favorite movie of last year. I don't think it's going to win Best Picture. I think Phantom Thread, better than Shape of Water, better than uh, Three Billboards. But everybody's been been priming this as a fight between Shape of Water and Three Billboards for a while now. And Get Out is that sneaky competitor that sort of wormed its way in and and continued and has been enduring. And I think if we could have the upset of Get Out winning, and that's where I'm going to throw my money. I mean, we'll see. Like I said, I really did like the movie, but just that advertising blitz just makes me feel strange. I would love to have Dunkirk won. I know it's not going to. It's a real shame because Dunkirk is truly a fantastic movie. The thing- Shout out to Raj Rawal, who is my third guest on the show, who hates Dunkirk. But uh, man, buddy, Dunkirk's great. You just got to get over it. Get over yourself. The thing that made me most want to see Dunkirk was watching The Darkest Hour, and they just kept talking about the actual battle of Dunkirk. I'm like, oh, that I could watch that movie and understand this whole war see, thing. That's what made me want to not see Darkest Hour, because I saw the trailer for Darkest Hour while I was watching Dunkirk, and I was like, this just seems like boring Dunkirk, because I mean, it doesn't have any of the actual fights. Yeah, you literally should just watch a couple of clips of Gary Ullman towards the end of the movie and go oh i did it and okay. it's really i definitely fell asleep during part of it it's it's very slow i mean it's a historical movie about a real guy it's gonna be an academy award nominee that you it's like eating granola you feel good you did it but you weren't excited while you were doing it or eating is our friends across the pond where dark stars made might say eating a little bit of muesli oh <laughs> they're so cute they are so cute you know what movie's not cute is jumper uh, the movie that we brought you on to talk segue. today. Nat Baymel hates Jumper, 2008 film, according to Wikipedia. Um, yep, I hate it so much I didn't even rewatch it for this podcast. You just I had that hatred I festered up and ready. I such vivid memories. I went to Wikipedia and read the plot synopsis for it and also didn't realize it was based on a book. And I read the book plot synopsis and wow, they had actually a pretty decent book to go off of. And they decided, what if we just change a whole bunch of things and make this completely completely unenjoyable oh man all right let's before we get into why you hate this movie let's give a little background for the folks at home who might not have seen it jumper is a 2008 american science fiction action film it's that's that's taking some liberties saying both of those things loosely based loose that's that's accurate loosely based on the 1992 science fiction novel of the same name written by stephen gould directed by doug Mm -hmm. lyman stars hayden christensen jamie bell rachel bilson max thoreau anna sophia robb diane lane michael rooker and samuel l jackson the film follows a, a young man capable of teleporting as he is chased by a secret society intent on killing him nat why do you hate jumper Okay, so a little bit of backstory for this. It was my senior year of college, best friend that I was living with at the time. I think it was a Friday night. The Friday night it came out, said, oh, we should go to the movies. And I was like, ah, there's nothing really playing. And he said, we should go see Jumper. I'm like, it looks kind of bad. And he goes, Nat, either we're going to go out and have fun or we're going to stay inside and do nothing. And I'm like, that sounds great. And so he dragged me to it. And we saw it. I hated everything about it, and actually, it's one of those things where I always find a positive and a negative, and my reaction to it is one of my dearest memories of my friend and I, because I remember we left the movie, and I screamed at him for about 15 minutes outside of the theater, everything I hated about the film. At one point, he was like, Nat, there are people in line, you're spoiling it for them, and I turned and screamed at the line, you're wasting your time and your money, and also spoiled it for them specifically. Screamed for another five minutes, then we started driving back home. Uh, he got a call on the drive home from me because I thought of another five minutes of things I hated about the movie and continue to scream about him about it. 
it's one of those films where you need a villain, obviously, in any film. And I mean, like an antagonist, let's say. And if it's a villain, it's always best if it's someone that you can see their point of view. Right. That you understand their motivation, but you can also see where they went wrong in their motivation. Whereas in this movie... I thought Samuel Jackson, the villain, was 100% right in everything he did, and the hero that we're supposed to be rooting for was completely unlikable, was complete dickheads, they were irredeemable, they didn't change in the end in any way, shape, or form, they were actively, like, fighting against what they said they wanted to do, and I'm just like, okay, so Samuel Jackson is the good guy right now, and I'm rooting for him, and then he failed, and so I just left the movie upset that the guy I was rooting for failed. I have a lot more to speak about this on the different points in the film. I'm just giving you a broad out. That's a good would, broad. I would That's love to broad. hear what you Here's, had to think about so this film. I had never seen this movie until you brought it to my attention. Um, it was one of those movies that I remember seeing the trailers for, and I was like, this looks like a big old pile of dog shit. And it turns out it was. Um, I think that my biggest problem with this movie is that it's marketed as an action movie, right? And then you go into the movie, and there's maybe over the course of – thank God this movie's short, by the way. We've had a spate of long movies, movies that are longer than two hours lately. Thank God this movie's less than 90 minutes. I mean, you say it is less than 90 minutes, but it feels, feels like an so eternity. Much longer. Yeah, and I uh, – there is so little action in this movie. There is one action sequence yeah. in the entire movie. Yeah. One. In the total running time of this movie, there are maybe 15 to 20 minutes of action total. And it's not compelling – the the characters you are 100% right are irredeemable the acting is atrocious oh i didn't even get to that yeah the rachel, acting rachel is bilson so bad. in this movie man rachel bilson was at, put, cast solely off of being at the height of her powers in uh, the oc but god i was just so distracted by her, her tiny body and her giant head she looks like a bobblehead yeah and she has those weird anime eyes yeah this is not this is a movie where it's like, oh, guess what? She does think that biting her lip is acting the whole time. And then he throw in the Kristen Stewart cameo at the very end. Oh, man. Another lip biting actress. I totally forgot about that until I reread the Wikipedia plot synopsis. Oh, yeah. I think that this it's it's just one of those movies where it's so top to bottom bad. And there were parts that just deeply offended because I do love comic book movies mm -hmm. and because I love comic books. I grew up on them. I love the lore. I love the tropes and everything. I just love it. And so the beginning of the film, you know, he as a teenager finds out he has this power to teleport and then he runs away from home. We flash forward a couple of years where he's an adult and you see he's been living his life by just stealing. Yeah. He's been stealing his entire life Large now at this point. Large scale stealing like poker chips, diving yeah. into bank vaults. He has a whole illuminated cabinet that he built with the finest Ikea shelving yes. to house all of his stolen bank money. And so we're, I guess, supposed to be like, oh, this is cool. Don't you wish you could be him? It's supposed to be that that entourage style male fantasy living exactly but it's also hayden christensen so you're just like i don't want to fucking be hayden christensen oh it's definitely supposed to because he like jumps to london and he's like snarky with his with his door his doorman he's yeah. like ah you don't need that umbrella he's like yeah maybe i will and, and then he, he goes up oh. and, and he'll also teleport to rome or something yeah bang abroad that he, he'll neg and then yeah. he'll just leave. And so it's like, oh, sweet, sweet. So there's just like weird STDs all around the continent. That is your fault for sure. Mm -hmm. And the part that there specifically where I'm just like, I wasn't going to hate it till the very end when I realized it didn't lead to anything is when you are seeing this establishment of his life and how it's just grand. He's living off of vices. He's using his powers for evil. There's a scene as he's about to get ready to leave. His TV is on and they're showing what looks like footage from Hurricane Katrina where you literally see some disaster. There's a flood. And there's people in the flood clinging into a rope and the announcer literally says if only there was someone who could do something to help them. Right. And then he kind of pauses and looks at it shrugs and leaves so you're like okay that's gonna be his arc he's gonna realize oh i've been using these powers selfishly this whole time i need to learn to use it for others for the greater good so i said okay i get it he's a character that we saw him get bullied now he's living this cool life it's a bit of a turnaround and he's gonna learn that you know great power comes great responsibility cool that never happens never happens it never happens it doesn't even come close to happening the only thing he does the only time he ever uses power to help someone else is his dumb stupid 
a fucking girlfriend that is completely irredeemable herself, that has no character whatsoever. She just bites her lip and says, oh, you're kind of weird now. I don't feel like I'm into this. Well, don't forget about the time that he helps his one-dimensional abusive dad who is all of a sudden is like mentally broken by the fact that his son just vanished. Yes. And chains his room up from the outside. Yeah. So we're going to be jumping all around here. It's Ah, okay. Hey, Uh, see? It's a metaphor. Yeah. So... (laughs) The big thing is Samuel L. Jackson. We'll get to him in a second, too. So he, Samuel L. Jackson is the best character in this whole movie. Yeah, because he's right. He's yeah. 100% right. So let's go to him for a second. It's so, the only time I've ever been a fan of a religious zealot in a movie. Yeah, that's the thing, because... I guess they're trying to say, oh, they're religious zealots and they're trying to murder these people. But at the same time, when you hear their reason and they say, yeah, they're abominations. They're using these powers for evil and we need to stop them. Otherwise, that's going to cause huge trouble. And then we see how they use their power and they're right. They're completely correct. And so he captures his girlfriend to hold hostage essentially to lure him in. But he doesn't kill her. He doesn't abuse her or anything. He's just using it as a means to an end. And I imagine if he killed him, he'd be like, okay, you're free to go now or whatever. So... He saves the girl. They, you know, strand him in the Grand Canyon or whatever. And then at the end, he says something the effect of, oh, so you think we should use the power to help people? And she kind of says, well, we could be selfish for a little while longer. Right. No, that was the whole arc. So you're just a horrible, vapid piece of shit, too. I want you both to die. I want Samuel Jackson to come out. I want him to be a sequel. I want him to murder you in the first five minutes. I want the rest of the 85 minutes of him being just pure gloating. That's all I need. And I love that there was supposed to be a sequel to this movie, and it was so clearly written and and left on that cliffhanger note where they're like, hey, we're going to make a sequel, and then nobody wanted to see this movie again. Yeah. Nobody wanted to see where the rest of this story took Hayden Christensen and Rachel Bilson. Yeah, and the other thing is there was another jumper dude. He ran into Griffin, I think his name was. Played by Jamie Bell. Looking scraggly. So... Jamie Bell is killing these religious zealots who are trying to kill them, and Hayden Christensen is saying, oh, we shouldn't kill them. And, oh, God, there was that scene where they had that speech where he was saying, hey, do you ever read Marvel team up? Yeah. That that scene triggered me more than anything in the movie. That was when I recalled my friend in the car ride home, and I remembered that, and I had to rant about that for another five minutes because it was the, – the gist of the monologue was essentially sometimes – these people with heroes, for example, Spider-Man and the Human Torch, they have powers, but sometimes they fight a villain and their powers aren't enough, so they have to team up to stop the villain. And I'm like, motherfucker, you are the villains. You're the villains. You know why? Because heroes help people. Spider-Man helps people. He realized that he was selfish with his powers and it lost his Uncle Ben as a result of it, and so he spent his life helping people. The Human Torch helps people. You're not helping anybody. You're trying to help your dumb, stupid girlfriend who's as selfish and stupid and dumb as you. And then they started fighting each other, and they murdered hundreds of people in their fight. Like They teleported to the desert. He teleported away. Then he threw a bus full of Taurus at him in the middle of the Sahara and they just teleported was it what, what the fuck happened to those people in the bus so there's just a bunch of people who were in a horrific topple over accident in the middle of the desert yeah and you just left them there because you wanted to save Rachel Bilson fuck you I hope Samuel Jackson slits your throat and bleeds you dry as we all laugh and say yeah this is what would happen this movie is so here, this for uh, I remember watching this movie and constantly checking to see where in time we were during the movie. Yeah, and just being flabbergasted at how poorly paced this movie is too, because Doug Liman, the director, had just this was his first movie directing j- after just coming off of Born uh, Born Identity. Excuse I me, didn't even realize that that was the director. It's the of this. same director, and Born Identity is a is a classic action movie, and it will always be regarded as such i think and for him to go from that to this it feels like you know how adam sandler said that he started making movies now where he's just like i'm gonna go on vacation with my family and so that's why we're gonna make stuff in hawaii it feels like doug lyman was like you know what i could use a vacation we're gonna go to egypt we're gonna go to 20 different countries and go shoot this movie let's go to prague let's go to tokyo guys this movie it's so it's it's absurd to me how you have a good action director and he's wasting his talents on this movie because there's no action in this movie whatsoever. There's no action and there's nobody that you care about. You're mad at at every single person the entire time to go back to what you were saying before about what movies would be better if they were horror. This would be better because a lot of times in the like, you know, 
Friday the 13th and Nightmare on Elm Street series, the first ones were played kind of straight where you're rooting for the teens. But then Jason and Freddy became so cool that you're just rooting for them to kill the teens. Right. And that's what I was rooting for in this movie. But it's supposed to be an action and it didn't work. But if it was a horror where I'm rooting for the quote unquote villain that we all like better than these stale, bland, white bread actors. It's like, okay, cool. If I didn't root for them to kill them in a scary situation, I would enjoy this movie a lot more. But instead, you're trying to show that they're the righteous ones and that he's the hypocrite, even though, again, he's 100% right. You are an abomination. You got these powers you didn't earn in any way, and you're using them for evil and killing people. Like, yeah. The world would be better without you. And you know what? Let's Let's take it one step further here and say, given the fact that you cast Hayden Christensen as your hero— when he is at this point probably best known for playing a villain in the uh, the Star Wars prequels, yeah, a whiny villain, a that whiny matter. villain, yeah. And then Rachel Bilson, who at this point again is best known from being a stuck up teen on the OC. You're not really having people play against type, but you're trying to get them to be viewed as characters that you care about. Yeah, and again, like I read the Wikipedia plot synopsis like an hour ago for the book. And the book, it makes a lot more sense with what they were doing. Yeah, tell me about this book. I haven't read, I haven't read anything about the Wikipedia version uh, so, or, or the book version. Excuse so there me. was no religious Illuminati. There was none of that. It was essentially the main character. He had three tormentors in his life. He had that bully. His dad was an alcoholic who beat his mom. And then um, through all of his adventures, the NSA sort of got onto him. And there was a guy in the NSA who was trying to trap him. Okay. And essentially – he realized in the end, oh, I'm using my powers for evil. And at one point, he somehow threw everything happened and got them all in a room at the same time and realized, wow, I could kill them right now, but that wouldn't make me happier. I'd be no better than you. And so he actually helped them realize the error of their ways and then, you know, united with the girl and then went on trying to be a better person. And it's a more introspective look. There's no overriding bad guy. And I know Hollywood thinks we're all dumb and we need just a big bad guy doing big bad guy things so we can root against them and know who the good people are and yeah i know if you're spending that much money you want to be as clear as you can and you don't want to have anything introspective or anything that could be too heady but at the same time you made it and it's also weird because in america if they're religious extremists there's a lot of people in the midwest and in the south who are going to be like well yeah no i am agree with them they're yeah. religious i'm a religious i like being religious yeah maybe that's why they put it in there like that which is also weird, too. It's like, oh, we're trying to do this commentary on religion, man. What else do you think is is part of why this movie went wrong? It Besides the fact that the acting was terrible, people were not cast to build up to their strengths, the writing was bad, the execution was bad. I would also say, like, just it felt bland to look at, too. There was nothing flashy about the cinematography. Everything kind of muddied together. Yeah, it's really boilerplate. Yeah, and I even uh, I remember the poster for it is that super generic blue and orange that you can just put next to a million other action movies from that time period and this one. So if you're flipping through channels, you, you see it. Nothing is going to pop out for you. Also, the special effects were dog shit, too, if we want to talk about that. Let's talk about that. I mean, the bus looked like an N64 uh, coming at you. Their little teleporting thing was just very, it might as well have just been like a zoom in, zoom out. Let's do that. I Like I said, it's been a while since I've seen it. I just remember uh, Nightcrawler from X-Men 2. That was a cool effect. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I remember yeah. that feeling pretty cool as a teleportation. Whereas this one just kind of looked like pop, pop. It's bad. Yeah. It's bad. And it you can't market this movie as an action movie for how little action there is. That's the I, I think that's gotta be my biggest complaint about this movie. It's the pacing is all off. The pacing makes no goddamn sense because it's a r it's played as a romance with like a roguish bank robber guy yeah. for about the first forty five minutes of the movie. This is one of those movies it makes me very happy these days when I see a movie that is decides to totally not even fuck with having a romantic subplot. I think that that is one of the things that could have made this movie so much better is if they got rid of the romantic subplot altogether and got rid of the childhood crush stuff and just focused on the actual sci-fi and action elements of the story. It's 
I mean, it it's very obvious that in movies of this scale that have this budget, they're like, okay, we need to try to attract as many people to the movie as we can. And again, it just makes it feel like you think we're dumb, Hollywood, and that you're thinking, it's like, oh, well, if we need women to come to this movie, so there has to be romance in it. It's like, women don't need romance to go see a movie. If you'd make a good action movie, it'll be perfectly fine. There's a lot of women who do that. My girlfriend loves comic book movies more than I do. Yeah. They don't care. They really don't care, especially when it's terrible. But Hollywood thinks they care. That's the problem. And, you know, Hollywood also thinks that we just care about action. Which is also weird that there was no action in this. Yeah, if you're going to if you're gonna, if you're gonna make an action... You got Doug Lyman? You got to make Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Born Identity, two high action movies. You got to... There's so many bullets flying around in those movies. And then all of a sudden you're just going to have somebody shoot out electricity? It'd be like getting Jordan Peele to do Schindler's List. It's like, uh, I mean, sure, he'd probably do something with it. But are we sure he's the guy that we want to Is he the guess? person who we want to go for? I mean, and here's the thing. I don't even mind false advertising for movies sometimes if it's a still a good movie, but they feel like they need a lie to get you in. An example that popped in my mind is The Grey with Liam Neeson. They advertise that as he's going to be fighting wolves and punching wolves. That was the ending shot of the movie, and you didn't get any sort of that resolution. But it was still a great movie. It was really intense. It was you know very much an exploration of man versus nature and man versus himself and right. nihilism and overcoming and finding your purpose. Right, right. I thought it was good. A pretty hard movie to sell in a trailer. So if you punch a wolf, I get that's going to get more people into it. Whereas this movie, they just kept showing the bus rolling over, the bus rolling over. So you're like, oh, cool. It's going to be teleporting people, throwing shit at each other. When it happened once at the very end. And the rest of it was people with those weird uh, like cattle prod sticks yeah. that they were using. I think there's very little that could be done to have made this movie better. And this is a question I've been asking a lot lately. In your mind, is there anything that Jumper could have done to have been a watchable movie? Or is it pretty much unsalvageable? Uh, here's the thing. Uh, I'm very much a writer. And I think a lot of times the problem is always with the script. And I don't even think it's – they had a good oh, director. Oh, God, the script was such dog shit too. We barely even talked about that. And that's the that's the main issue I have with the film is – they they needed at least another two or three drafts of that thing. But I guess they were on a time crunch, maybe. Either that or someone saw it and said, yes, I'm willing to invest millions of dollars in this for some reason. Because I can't remember the exact quote, but it's essentially you can, with a bad script, make a bad movie. Or like well, you, you with a good script, you can make a bad movie, but you can't make a good movie with a bad script. Correct. That's what it is. Yeah. And the script was awful. The, you can read through it. There's a bunch of plot holes. The character motivations don't make any sense. You can tell if people aren't going to like this character. You just need to get people who are honest and will give you feedback on it. I don't even know who wrote the script. So was it someone who – It was. It was uh, David S. Goyer. Really? Yeah. Maybe people were just too afraid to tell him, this is bad, man. I guess. The, David S. Goyer, Jim Alls. Who uh who wrote Fight Club, and Simon Kinberg, who wrote some other stuff. You know what? I'm turning the corner on this movie. I'm starting to really like it right now because this is showing you. He wrote X Men. He wrote Mr. and Mrs. Smith and Sherlock Holmes. This is showing. This is motivational. This is showing you. Hey, you can't win all the time, and even even people who are really good at stuff falter. No one's perfect. Use that as motivation. It's like hey, yeah, yeah. you know you. you put out something good sometimes it's not always good so you have to just keep working at it all the time i, I like this movie now uh now knowing that seeing the positive spin and how you could get the born identity guy to go to this after that and people who wrote fight club and people who wrote x-men and mr and mrs smith good movies oh and this is what they turn maybe this is one of those movies they just did for the paycheck i get, i mean it it had a budget of 85 million dollars and you know what it still made like a, a fucking big chunk of money at the box office it made I, 222 I million dollars it was the 28th highest grossing film of that year if i remember correctly yeah that sounds about right they even made video games they made novel tie-ins but it's just one of those things that like i don't want to have a movie where you're rooting for the quote unquote bad guys but that's exactly what you do in this movie. You kind of, I kind of found myself rooting for the fucking bully. Yeah, the guy who throws him into he he throws him under the ice practically. You know, inadvertently, not on purpose, but yeah, like but almost murdered him. And in retrospect, I wish he had. 
That yeah. would have made me enjoy the movie a lot more. That would have been great. If the character, if the if the if the 15-year-old boy had been murdered at the very beginning of this movie. Legitimately, if the boy had been murdered and then the film was just the trial of that bully, much better film. Yeah. Such a better film. That's how I would have uh, improved it. If it was just a courtroom procedural for 90 minutes. <laughs> and then Samuel L. Jackson is the judge. He still, and then he <laughs> sends him by with the, that cattle prod device thing. And Rachel Bilson is the court reporter who is just staring blankly ahead and just biting her lip, wearing that giant with that giant ass head of hers. Yeah, Rachel Bilson has a head like Mrs. Pac-Man. God, I remember I hadn't seen her in forever, and I just in the research trying to remember this movie, seeing her face and going, "Oh yeah," and it's. A weirdly flat face, too. Yeah. Just straight, like, I feel like if she were to see her profile, it would just be concave. It would make it more look like Miss Pac-Man, just like that concave. Yeah. I even have the, on the Wikipedia page that has this press photo that was taken on set, and they look so fucking smug. It's Hayden Christensen and Rachel Bilson. I'm going to show it to you in case you hadn't seen it already. But it's just them on set in Rome, and it's just uh, like, oh, God. And Hayden Christensen just looks like, this is going to be the greatest fucking movie of all time. That's my that's my Hayden Christensen impression. They look like a high school couple in their first week of college, really smug, going, yeah, we were hot shit, and we're going to own this place, too. Yeah, their parents trusted them enough to send them off to Rome on a trip by themselves. Trust funded them enough to do it. Oh, God. And the part where they finally... Okay, there is one gratifying part of this movie, and it's the part when when after all of the dumb buildup, when Rachel Bilson and Hayden Christensen finally have sex in the hotel room in Rome, and I'm just like, okay, we got that out of the way. Thank God. I don't need to have all this stupid sexual tension, and you're so clearly going to fuck. It take, uh, it's a you drag it out for twenty minutes. Bullshit. I completely forgot about that because yeah, they were friends with a romantic ties. I guess when he was fifteen, then he ran away, then he came back, and it's like, yeah, oh, you you were the boy that left me behind. He so clearly had a crush on her. Yeah, and now it's the we we know we saw the trailer, we saw you make out, we know this is going to happen. Yeah, again, it's just unnecessary subplots to throw in because women love romance. I guess let's give them something. Yeah, I guess yeah, if women love romance. Oh, you know what? Let's get you know. I think we can finally get women to come see this terrible movie if we make sure that Rachel Bilson kisses a guy. Yeah, which you don't need. I mean, Frozen, one of the most successful Disney films of however many years, there was no romantic. Like anything in that movie, you don't need romance to get girls to enjoy something. You just need good story. It's universal. It's like cross gender. It's anything you need to get people to like something. And especially when there's no chemistry between them whatsoever. Would this movie have been better if at those very beginning scenes when they're in the ice and the river and the snow globe, if the snow globe spawned a magical wisecracking snowman? Because I think, yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, it would have been if much better. If this movie had just become Jack Frost midway through. Yeah, and Samuel Jackson was Olaf the Snowman. Yeah, see, see, this movie this is. I don't think we've ever had a movie on here where by making it a completely different movie is the only way to save it. Memory yeah. does not remember. My memory does not recall any other time when this has happened. And again, you could have because it's not like one of those things where the script was good, but oh, they miscast this person or the effects were kind of weird because you know some films you can do that with but again you just needed a complete rewrite from like this felt like a first draft of a movie Mm -hmm. because i've i've written scripts before and i've you know shown them to friends and i've a common note is like oh these main characters are super unlikable so you just put in all these quirks to just make people want to root for them nope and i did not this time poor hayden christensen i i don't know is he a bad actor i i didn't like what he was hard to tell whether he's a bad actor given his track record I Hayden Christensen sort of exists in like the Schrodinger's cat universe of whether or not he's a good actor. Yeah, it is. We've not been proven in a fully definitive way whether or not Hayden Christensen deserves to have a film career. Because over time, my heart has softened for him with those prequels just because you're in front of green screens. George Lucas didn't quite know what he was doing with that. Like his, I saw videos of him directing. And it's just him behind all these monitors drinking a coffee saying, no, eh, good enough. Let's go to the next thing. And also you're supposed to be whiny talking about sand. And then all of a sudden you're a bad guy killing children, but it's also, 
I, I don't know. And then this movie, he's irredeemable, and the best actor couldn't pull anything out with it. It's like we were talking about three billboards. Now, a lot of people don't like the movie, but they will admit the acting was at least good. Right. Because you didn't bring those horrible characters to life. Cool. What could you bring to life with this dude? It's like, hey, he steals a bunch of shit. He goes on an adventure, and he steals a bunch of shit. Cool. He plays it like he it and he he's the same character at the beginning. And, and, you know and, what? I think I am gonna go ahead and say that Hayden Christensen is a good actor because he plays a terrible character in this movie. Yeah, and he plays it so well. He does play a really awful person very well in this movie. Those are the choices he's made. Those are the choices he's made. He has no he uh, Hayden Christensen. You know, you're all right in my book. Yeah. After this, after some after some soul searching, Hayden Christensen, you can come be on this podcast anytime you want, buddy. <laughs> he uh, does cinematography. What else has he done besides this and the prequels? Uh, not a whole lot. I just looked at his page on Facebook. This kind of killed his career. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh, Hayden. He was in uh, New York. I love you. He was in. Yeah, this is. I mean, this is like the end of Hayden Christensen's career right here. Just hard stop in two thousand eight. Yeah, but before that, he was on the famous Jet Jackson. He was on Are You Afraid of the Dark? He Wait, was on what? Goosebumps. Yeah, what episode? On of which one? Uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? He was on the Tale of Bigfoot Ridge. God, I need to go rewatch that now. But that, that's how I'm going to determine whether or not he's a good actor. Since Jumper came out, he has been in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight movies. Nine movies. Well, one of them is in post-production, excuse me. Eight movies. And I assume we've heard of none of them. Uh, except for New York, I Love You. Yeah, basically. He's been in New York, I Love You, Takers, Vanishing on 7th Street, Quantum Quest, A Cassini Space Odyssey, Outcast, American Heist, 90 Minutes in Heaven, and First Kill. Bro. That- <laughs> Hayden. No, Hayden. Oh, I'm so sorry, buddy. And... God, is Samuel L. Jackson the only person who survived this film? I think so. You know what? This movie, hey, what? Samuel L. Jackson's impervious. Samuel L. Jackson is a bulletproof person, and, and he's the best character in the whole goddamn movie. And I also just realized this is the same year he debuted as Nick Fury in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. See? And Samuel L. Jackson is like cinema insurance. If you put him in your movie, you'll at least have one part of your movie that's enjoyable to watch. Yeah, and it's going to be Samuel L. Jackson putting his putting that scenery all up in his mouth and chewing it, and always playing Samuel L. Jackson, and that's the key. Uh, Nat, thank you so much for coming on today, buddy. Uh, thank you for having me, man. It felt cathartic to get that off my chest. Just for years, you don't understand. Years, I've been trying to get someone else to watch this movie just so they would understand why I hate it, and not one person in. Ten years now has been willing to do it, so I appreciate this. That's the thing. As soon as I told people we were going to talk about this episode, this show on this episode, everybody was like, "Jumper, that's a pretty good movie." And I was like, "What's wrong with you people? This movie's garbage." Anyway, Nat, again, uh, thank you for putting this horrible movie into my life. Um, where can my listeners find your work? Uh, if you doodle me, uh, Nat Baymel, you can find me at Nat Baymel on Twitter, Instagram, on Facebook, YouTube. Uh, my website, NatBayMill.com. I'm, I'm the only NatBayMill in existence, mm-hmm. so if you type it in, something will pop up. And, of course, download uh, the new album. Uh, what's that name of it one more time on iTunes and Spotify and all that good stuff? Oh, well, after shitting on this for an hour, it's called Be Nice. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you can find me at DietJ on Twitter and Instagram. JLightComedy.com for show dates. And uh, this has been another episode of Blockbusting. Guys, go see something good for a change. 